Hey friends, welcome back to Practical Bible Living. We are studying the first epistle of Peter, and today we're looking at verses 13 through 17. Now previously we had seen that the Apostle Peter was teaching us regarding our new citizenship, which is in heaven, which we receive when we are born again by the Spirit of God, believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so with this in mind, we have become as pilgrims and sojourners who are just passing through this world because our citizenship is no longer of this world. Then, with this in mind, the Apostle Peter reminded us of how we should behave while we are in the world as citizens and even ambassadors who represent the kingdom of God. In the coming passage, the Apostle Peter begins to elaborate further about how we should behave while we are in the world. And what we're about to see is the use of a term that often frightens many people, a term that many people don't really like to hear today because they don't often consider it from the biblical context. And what is that word? That word is submit or submitting, or submission. Now, in the coming passage of this epistle, we're going to see that the Apostle Peter here, he's going to speak about the importance of, sub of submitting, the importance of submitting, particularly in three areas. Firstly, there is submission to your governing system where you live. Second, there's submission to, Okay, the submission of servants to their masters. And of course, we'll talk about what that means when we get to that. And then we'll talk about submission within a marriage. Now, today we're only looking at verses 13 through 17, which concerns submission to the governing systems where we live. The others we'll look at afterwards. And while we do, we must remember that Peter was just speaking to us, okay, about our behavior and our conduct as ambassadors to the kingdom of God while we are in the world. And so we're going to take a look here at what Peter writes to us in that context, and we'll take a look at what else the Bible has to say about this very topic. So why don't we go ahead and read here verses 13 through 17 together. We read the following. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Well, the first thing we see here is this instruction for the believer who is now only a sojourner and a pilgrim in the world to submit to every ordinance of man. See that? Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. What does he even mean by that? Well, he makes it clear when he says, whether to the king, whether to the king or to the governors. And so that suggests to us that he is speaking of the different forms of the different levels of governments that oversee the land. Now, Peter is instructing that we are to submit to our governments, but not just because it's Peter's opinion, right? Because Peter says here, for the Lord's sake, right? Submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. And we should know that if we do something for the Lord's sake, then it's because it's something that the Lord himself desires and even expects of us, right? Let's ask a quick question. Is it unusual to think that God is a God of order? That God is a God who has rules and expects us to live by those rules? 
See, we must understand that God is a God of order, okay? a God of structure. We have a very neat and organized and very detailed God who created the whole world. And there is structure and order for all things. See, without any order, there would be chaos. A world of chaos is a world without God. But God has set an orderly way for this world to function for a very good reason. We can try for a moment to imagine a world where there is no order, no leadership, no enforcement of rules or laws. Just think about it, and quickly we'll see the chaos that would be in the world. Look at countries where there is no law or order, and you'll see a very scary place to live. A place where there are no lights at night, where the rates of theft and murder is the highest, where there isn't enough food for the people, right? You'll see a very scary and chaotic world. And so God has always given instruction for order and leadership. And this has always been the case. On one level, where people submit to the laws and systems of their own count, uh, countries, even counties, and even down to the level of the simple family, where even then there is an order and structure, right? Which God had clearly intended as we see throughout the Bible. Now, as we continue to discuss what the Apostle Peter is teaching in this passage, let's just take a look at what the Apostle Paul says regarding this very thing. And just like everything else that we've seen, we can surely anticipate that they are in agreement, teaching the very same thing because it's the very same God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is teaching through them, even by the power of his Holy Spirit. So let's take a quick read here. Um, in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. And we'll look at Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 6. Let's take a look here. The Apostle Paul writes, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Sound familiar? For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister. That again. An avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for the conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. So, very clearly here, we see something uh, very similar to what the Apostle Peter was saying. Okay, very clearly. Okay, and we can summarize what the Apostle Paul has said here, okay, because it's very clear that all the authorities in the world are appointed by God. You see? They would have no power or authority unless it was permitted by God because God is in control of all things. Even, we saw in verse 4, right? It even describes them as being God's ministers, okay, who are appointed to punish those who do evil in the world. See, they're God's ministers to you for good. You see that? For he is... God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And remember that this includes even those who are not God's people. See, Even those who are not believers in the gospel. God can permit even them to be in position of authority where they are for this very reason. See, And we'll see examples of that, of how God even uses foreign kings who God has appointed to be in positions of power 
to carry out God's own judgments on the earth. See, that is biblical. That is what we know from the Word of God. Furthermore, let's see what is written in the epistle to Titus chapter 3. Let's take a field trip over there, Titus chapter 3. Let's just look at the first two verses and see what it said here. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Sounds a lot like Peter's epistle, doesn't it? Being reminded to be subject, okay? To be subject, meaning to submit to the authorities to obey the laws of the land, ready for good work and behaving in this proper manner toward all people so that as ambassadors of the kingdom of God, they can see God's perfect standards through us, right? Absolutely. Now, as you suspect, and you've probably been waiting to see if we would discuss it, and of course we would, we certainly acknowledge that the world is filled with sin and corruption. And though the authorities in the world are only granted to be in such position by the authority of God, they can go astray and they can become corrupted themselves, right? And they begin to implement laws that are not from God and even opposing God. Now, we might ask, how can God appoint authorities in the world who become corrupted and occasionally do evil? Well, my friends, remember, it's no different from how God has chosen a special people to himself, right? Though even God's own special people have routinely departed from the ways of God to do the things that are evil. And so it's clear. It happens. It's a fallen world, right? Now, when this happens, where the governing authorities insist that the people who they govern do things that are evil and oppose God, what does the believer do? What does the Christian do? What does the true Christian do? The one that follows the true Jesus of the Bible. Well, to understand that, we don't just decide to do whatever crosses our own minds, but like everything else, we look to the Bible for an example. Now, there was a time after the Lord had ascended up to the Father in heaven, when the apostles went out preaching the gospel, preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. And we can read about Peter and John doing this very thing in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. You see, during their preaching, they had healed a man. See, they healed a man. And the chief priests and the elders, who were in fact one group of authority to the Jews at the time, well, they didn't like it especially as the healing was done in the name of Jesus Christ. So they, being in authority to the Jews, commanded Peter and John not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore. Well, let's just take a look at Peter and John's response in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 18 through 31. Let's just take a quick peek. We read the following. So they called them, and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. And being let go, they, right, John and uh, Peter, they, being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, 
Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Do you see that? Very, very wonderful passage to read and to understand. Hopefully you've read this uh, chapter or this even this book on your own already. But you see, to the believer, the things of God come first. Okay, And yes, being obedient and submitting to government is a command from God in order that we live in an orderly world. But there are times when the commands of the authorities in the world conflict with the commands and the things of God. In that instance, our devotion will always be to the things of God because our obedience is first to God. Here, we saw that when the authority threatened Peter and John not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore, they responded to these authorities by saying in verse 19, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. See that? There is going to be situations where we have to realize there is a conflict between what the authority says and what God says, right? Especially what God says to us. And what the apostles have implied here is that they are to listen to God more. See that? More. We always follow the commands of God before anything else. Okay, Don't be mistaken now. Listening to God's commands will be very strictly related to his instructions, right? Very strictly related to his instructions for us as found written in the scriptures of the Bible. So you and I, for example, we cannot make up things or try to ignore the laws of the land by pretending as if something conflicts with our biblical duties when they don't, just so we can sneakily get out of it, right? God knows, he surely knows, if we are living and making decisions from the integrity of our hearts. So know for sure that God expects us to live honestly. However, okay, however, in the instance when we are commanded to disobey God, okay, especially things we know scripturally we are not to do, then we know that there is something wrong and our primary duty is to obey God above everyone and everything else. And so, what was the Lord's response when Peter and John ignored the authorities in this matter? Well, we read that they prayed to God, right? In verse 29, they said, they said down here in verse 29, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. See that? God responded to this with his approval even causing a shaking. The place where they assembled together were shaken. See that? Even causing a shaking in the place where they were assembled and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. See that? Speaking in what? Speaking with boldness. Isn't that what they asked for? That's exactly what they requested. Because they did what was right, okay, which was to obey God first above all. And God confirmed to them by hearing their request and confirming their request and filling them with the Spirit and giving them boldness, right? Now, in the very next chapter of the book of Acts, okay, chapter 5, let's go there real fast. Chapter 5, verses 27 to 29, we read the following. Something very similar that happened again. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, 
Okay, the apostles, the, the high priest asked the apostles, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. See that? Okay. You see in verse 29 here, this is, remember, this is Peter. This is Peter. The very same Peter whose epistle we are studying. The very same Peter who is advising us to be obedient and submit to the authorities in his epistle, right? Who's saying here to the authorities that we ought to obey God rather than men. So, Peter is not contradicting himself, but rather Peter knows that we must obey authorities because that is what God desires for us. However, our obedience will always be to God first above all. And so if there is a conflict, they must reject the command of men and obey the command of God instead. And you can continue that chapter on your own and you'll find that the authorities in the presence of even the high priest here, they physically beat and abuse the apostles to inflict physical wounds on them before letting them go and again threatening them. You know, back in the Old Testament day, okay, back in the day in the Old Testament, there was a king named King Nebuchadnezzar. You may have heard of him, the king of Babylon. He was a man who didn't even know God, okay? And in fact, He worshipped his own false gods. But God had appointed this king to punish the tribes of Israel, right, who were in the land of Judah, right, God's very own people, because they did evil things. They were God's people, but God punished them by appointing the king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, to go and destroy Jerusalem and take the people captive into the land of Babylon. So, We see how God appointed and used this king to execute his own judgment. In fact, God expected that they all, that his own people, God expected that his own people surrender to this king and to obey him, right? We can read about that a little bit here in Jeremiah. I think it's very important just to touch base on that. Jeremiah chapter 27, and let's look at verses 5 through 11 very quickly here. This is um, the word of God through Jeremiah. Let's look at the word of God here. I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are on the ground by my great power and by my outstretched arm and have given it and have given it to whom it seemed proper to me. Note that. And now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. Hmm, interesting. And the beasts of the field I have also given him to serve him. So all nations, all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until the time of his land comes and then many nations and great kings shall make him serve them. And it shall be, look at this, and it shall be, that the nation and kingdom which will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and which will not put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation I will punish, says the Lord, with the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, until I have consumed them by his hand. Therefore, Do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your soothsayers, or your sorcerers who speak to you saying, you shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. They prophesy a lie to you to remove you far from your land, and I will drive you out and you will perish. But the nations, look at this, but the nations that bring their necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will let them remain in their own land, says the Lord, and they shall till it and dwell in it. Wow. So we see, we see here, okay, God has authority over all, even causing his own people to 
to submit to the authority of a foreign king who does not even know the true God, right? But on the other hand, consider this. While God's people were captive in Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar set up a golden image and commanded that all people bow down to it. Now, this is clearly against God, right? And there were three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who refused to bow down to the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up because they obeyed God firstly above all. What did this King Nebuchadnezzar do? Well, he threw them in a seven times hotter furnace. But God preserved them and saved them through it. A very wonderful passage you should read about in the book of Daniel. But God demonstrated not only his approval, but also his pleasure in that they refused to obey King Nebuchadnezzar when that king imposed a law that opposed God. In fact, let's just read a little bit from that passage in, in Daniel chapter 3. Very wonderful thing to read. Uh, Daniel chapter 3, and we'll look at verses 13 through 18. Okay, Let's just take a look. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king, and the king Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time, you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made? Good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, meaning even if he doesn't, even if God wills that that's the end of them, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. See that? The three men here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they understood that although they are to obey the governing authority, it's a different story when they are commanded to do something evil, when they are asked to do what was against the commands of God. The, in that instance, they disobeyed the commands of men and obeyed instead the command of God. So do notice that in the context of this very same king, King Nebuchadnezzar, we saw that God expected that the people honor the authority given to this king because that authority was given to him by God to execute judgment and reestablish order among his own people. But at the same time, as we saw with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God did not expect them to follow this king's commands when that king began to enforce laws that violate the commands of God. So in this very same king, King Nebuchadnezzar, we see both sides of the story. And surely, you can find other examples in the Bible, but this came to mind as another very clear example, right? Our passage here. Now, in our passage here, okay, in our passage here, verse 14, the same thing that the apostle described, right? That is, that God has this system of authority and this system of order in place in order to punish evildoers and even for a praise to those who do good, right? So these, the king supreme or governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. 
See that? And so, as we can see from this, God uses this governing system in the world in order to punish those who do crimes, even crimes that are not acceptable by his holy standards. Now, remember, the Apostle Paul had described the authority as God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. We also saw from Jeremiah, God had referred to King Nebuchadnezzar. Even King Nebuchadnezzar, he referred to him as his servant. Why? Because he used King Nebuchadnezzar to create a form of order to execute wrath on those who practice evil, even if it was his own people, right? And Peter confirms here the same, right? That God puts up kings and governors and and governments in order to punish the evildoers, okay? And it makes sense, guys. It makes sense. And by the way, God can use whomever he wants. He is God, and he knows perfectly how to do what he desires to do. So in verse 15 of our passage, the apostle Peter here repeats what he said back in verse 12, okay? Regarding how the way that we behave while we are in the world will be remembered by those around us. But not only that, here he adds that it will silence the ignorance of foolish men. Those who speak evil about the things of God concerning things of which they themselves have no understanding. You see, it will put those people to silence, right? And in verse 16, where we read here, something very important, a very important point where we're just making, you know, we were just making this point a short while ago. You see, we are obedient to God. And so we submit to the authorities that he, God, put in those positions of authority. But we do that as free men, right? Not as slaves. We do that as free men. You see, we are not slaves to the authorities, but we are as free. But the Apostle Peter makes a very clear point here by saying, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice. Meaning, our being free, okay, serving, following all the commands of the authority, okay, while being free in the world is not some kind of excuse or free pass for us to just go and do whatever we please, right? As if to violate the laws and living in sin because, you know, though we live as free men under the authorities, yet we are bond servants of God. And so we are still held to the holy, high and holy standards of God, right? As ambassadors of God. As believers, God is our master and we are his servants, which is not a scary thing. Remember what we discussed before. We are either servants of the world or we are servants of God. And it's important to remember that the servants of the Lord will experience the most amazing freedom compared to those who are servants of the world, who are truly the ones in bondage because serving the one true God frees us, right? It frees us from the bondage of sin and the bondage of the world. Thank you, Lord God, for letting us become your servants, right? Amen. And finally, my friends, in verse 17, okay, we see that we are to honor all people. We are to honor all people. Okay, what people? Well, he summarizes here, love the brotherhood, love the brotherhood which, by the way, is not some club or cult or political party. Brotherhood refers to the brethren in Christ, your new spiritual family, when you are born again. So love your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Fear God. Okay? And finally, honor the king, which is another reminder of those who God has put into authority. So we should live a godly life to honor all people, submitting to the laws of the land, but obeying God instead when the laws of the land reject God's command for us, right? Listen, reach over and grab your wallet. Do you see a driver's license in there? Well then, then you should know that we have to drive according to traffic laws. And those traffic laws, for example, they exist to keep us safe. 
and to keep other people safe and to keep an order on the road. Without traffic laws, there would be too many accidents. Too many people would die. There would be so much chaos, right? And God expects us to follow those commands, those laws of the land, right? Because there is a good purpose in it. And if we don't follow them, well, we just might get pulled over. If we're not injured, we might get pulled over, find a ticket. We might have to appear before a judge, and the judge may enforce a penalty. You know, some people may even have to spend time in jail, depending on how severely they broke the laws. And these people in authority, the police who pulls you over, the judge who hands you a penalty, they may not even be believers in the gospel. They may not even know the one true God, but regardless, God has permitted that they are in that position of authority, and we are expected to abide by the laws of the land, especially as citizens of heaven who are just passing through, especially if they are not causing us to reject the commandment of God. See, we have to respect other people and their property, right? Those are laws and things we have to abide by, and there's a good reason for it. We have to pay our taxes, right? As the Lord Jesus himself said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. See, we must do those things, but in keeping with the commands of the Lord our God. And we shouldn't fool ourselves, by the way, friends. We should not fool ourselves thinking even for one second as if the God of the Bible is not in full control of all things. He surely is. He surely is. Now, knowing these things, then we'd better really be spending more times in our Bibles gaining discernment about what is from God and what is not from God, right? We should know for sure that the world now has become a very evil place. The world has increasingly rejected the name of Jesus. And the commands of God are being increasingly rejected on a daily basis. The world has increasingly been introducing more and more laws that conflict with the moral principles and the commands of our righteous God. And so in the time that we live, while we live in submission to the laws of the land, how much more should we know the scriptures, having the Holy Spirit in order that we may be able to discern right from wrong, to discern what is the will of God versus what is the corruption of men, so that we may be obedient to God in everything, including the rejection of the commandments of men that oppose our God, right? Friends, in the sneaky and evil world of deception that exists today, you cannot do without it. Okay? You cannot do any of this without being in the Bible daily see, and walking with the Lord Jesus Christ daily through the Bible regularly. See, more and more deception is coming. Darker and darker days are ahead, even prophetic days, which the Lord Jesus Christ already told us, will be days like has never been before since the history of the entire world. And we should know the warnings and the cautions, they are there written for us in the Bible about the very things that we should reject and the very things that we should stay away from never denying the name of Jesus Christ just so that we can be included among the world systems, right? We're cautioned about those things, right? Even the Antichrist, who is likely already in the world, will deceive many people and try to cause all people to reject the one true God and even cause people to worship him instead, right? Even creating laws that require to take certain things, like certain marks, right? And do certain things which we should not do. You see, surely the Bible speaks very clearly of those things. And if those things are at the door, friends, then shouldn't we be on alert, girded, carrying the sword, which is the word of God, the Bible, prepared for every spiritual battle, which is very quickly manifesting in the physical world with an intensity as never seen before? Well, I pray that we have discernment. I pray that we all have discernment, okay? We should obey God. And God says, obey your laws and the authorities who are put in place by his own permission, right? While you are pilgrims and sojourners passing through the land. 
but always obey God above everything else. And you need the good discernment of the Bible. Now, coming up in the passage here remains further discussion about the notion of submitting as it relates to those who work as a kind of servant in the world, who have masters over them. And then after that will be this, the discussion about submitting as it relates to marriage. And so Peter is certainly not dodging the difficult discussions here, right? But he's certainly teaching us as the Lord Jesus Christ teaches through him, even by the power of his Holy Spirit. My friends, until the next one, wishing you all a very blessed week.